It is absolutely an honor and pleasure to be with you tonight, Katya, and everyone else who watches the replay of this moment or who happens to be tuning in live with us. This is our Monday Night to Kingdom Within podcast, where we are going on the journey of transformation that we all go through by actually remembering who and whose we are. And Katya and her husband, Peter, have some phenomenal programs around the boxes of language and how words have kept us safely separate from one another for far too long. And now it's time, as I've been saying for a long time, that we need to drop the walls and maintain our foundation of belief systems that make us feel safe and secure enough to not lash out and attack the threat of change that looms near us when we are in the midst of greatness which ultimately is what we all have an opportunity to do right now. And it's really about becoming great in the moment. And we talk a lot about joy and earn being the letters that spell journey. And so it's like, are you focused on joy or are you focused on the earn? And so mm -hmm. I just had some experiences of the earn in my own life and then being able to transmute that into an opportunity. And Katya, you have done the same too throughout so many instances over the last many years for sure. And I want to say before I, I ask you to share your story of transformation, and I, I just feel like it's significant I lost my train of thought in that moment. I was going to, oh darn it. Don't you hate it when it happens live and you don't have anything you can do about it? It's just like, well, I guess it's just time to give you an opportunity to share something. Absolutely. Um, so let me just put my tea down. Um, so let's get right into it actually, because um, it's an exciting topic tonight and what I guess I'm going to start with is that, yeah, my husband and I have been on this journey for quite a few years, and I'm going to speak personally for something that I'm committed to um, based on my experience is I'm really in the, uh, I'm very committed to uh, a new paradigm of education. We'll just put quote unquote education um, because I've had, based on my own experiences and having three daughters who went through the education system. I really got present to um, how that education system is one dimensional. So uh, I'm going to be going into it further um, in some of my sharing once I uh, talk a bit about what the boxes of language is all about, but that our education system is um, it's like a spoon, spoon feeding type of education learning. And I'm all about a discovery learning where we're in the, adventure of discovery of who we are, how we operate, what our life is for. And so that was kind of the thing that's always been behind me um, in regards to, you know, sharing information and the teachings that, um, you know, we've put a curriculum together. So um, I guess the best place to start is really just starting with the, um, the topic of born into boxes of language. And what does that mean? What does that actually mean? So, um, we are all born into this world and we have, you know, family dynamics. We have our, you know, environment we're born into and all of it's constructed in language. So whether we're aware of it or not, we're actually being born into this environment of language. And these boxes of language, words and these different things that we're witness to dictate and they actually construct the reality that we experience. And they're also uh, dictating our ways of being and acting, whether we're actually aware of it or not. And they're so fundamental because um, they drive a lot of the ways we choose. So for example, I'll give you some ideas about what boxes of language could be around. So we could have boxes of language around wealth, finance, money, sex, food, health, religion, you know, how we raise our children, 
And it wasn't until I really got into um, understanding boxes of language that I really understood how much it was prevalent in who I was being and what the types of choices I was making. And most shockingly was how automatic my life was. Like I was thinking I was making choices, but I was actually, you know, not really making choices. I was actually doing what kind of patterns were um, shown to me as a child. And I just took those on and I started to do kind of the same thing, like my parents and so forth. So um, when I found out about these boxes of language, it opened up a whole new world for me. So uh, in an exciting way, because it was like the whole world of possibility opened up where I was like living kind of limited in, you know, some of the things I was experiencing. And um, that's why I'm so excited to share tonight, because I'm hoping that this might be able to open up and have other people see the same thing and, you know, kind of identify what maybe is more automatic versus really making that conscious choice in what you're taking on in life. So the other big um, important thing to bring across is contexts because contexts actually frame how we view ourselves, how we view others, nature, life, um, God, source. Um, and it's really important to identify, um, especially the context we have for who we say we are. So this box of language context um, idea and this thing that came across um, in my, you know, in my own discovery, um, I got present to this, this idea of who I wound up being versus who I actually am. So when I talk a bit into that, what I mean is, is when we're born into this world, um, we actually, um, we're, we're very much influenced by our parents, by our school, by culture, by media, society. And so, a lot of who we are is who someone has said we are. And, and if you really look at your immediate family, it's usually your parents have a major influence in who you become. So that environment of language that we're born into is actually what molds and shapes us into who we become. So the big question at this point is knowing that, are, are we authentic and are we actually being our natural self-expression or are we being who someone else said we're being so it's just something to take into um, account when we're looking at um, again just so i can go back a little bit here because i'm a stand for um, a, a new paradigm of education the education that i want to bring forward or that i'm bringing forward as i talk about um, some of the things that i've learned is that it, it has to be an, educa an education about the inside out. So it's about really discovering first who we are on the inside, what drives our ways of being and acting, um, you know, what makes us tick, what makes us make these choices, because it's really important to, to really be aware of what choices we're making and what better time than now with everything that's been going on is really get present to every decision we make is having a huge impact. And, you know, we don't really realize the, 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 the type of impact, but it is, it's having a, a tremendous impact. So we want to be making decisions that are, you know, are true to who we are, that are, you know, based on the values that we, you know, we have. So that's why identifying language and having this discussion around context is so important because what I'm going to drive towards tonight is really um, identifying the context for who we say we are. That's probably the most uh, most important one because it will then expand out into all other relationships. Context. So I have, context. what was that? Context leads to concept. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I, I have two, um, two cool quotes I want to bring into the conversation um, because there's been a lot of people over thousands of years that have spoken to the importance of language and context. And, and one is by Desmond Tutu, who said, language is very powerful. Language does not just describe reality. Language creates the reality it describes. 
it's hugely profound. Um, and then the second quote that I want to share is by Haviz, who's a Persian lyric poet, and he said, the words you speak become the house you live in. So that's how important um, language is. And I think that we don't do enough to really, you know, especially in our education system, to really understand that words are like magic. Every word you utter is creating something. And we want to be careful of what we're actually creating. It's such a sacred gift and tool that we've been given. And I feel like today, sometimes we don't really value it and understand the, the power of word words. So that's kind of what we're going to be um, delving into tonight. So what I can do right now is um, bring my own experience and some of the, uh, the things that I experienced um, that talk right into these boxes of language and how they impacted my life. And um, yeah, just uh, I'll start with uh, maybe just my background of how I, uh, how I grew up. So I grew up in a family that was a strict Catholic background. Like it was a uh, very religious, very obedient, very disciplinarian um, upbringing. And I really didn't have a lot of choices. A lot of the choices that, um, you know, other people might make in regards to, you know, um, the food I ate, how, what I could wear was all made for me. And it was a very restrictive, very limited um, environment for self-expression. So one of the things that was in my background as a box of language was religion. So it played such a fundamental part in, in my life and who I was um, looking back now. And I didn't realize just what kind of impact it had on who I was and who I was being. So one of the things that impacted my view of who I was, was this idea about the creation story, which is this in language. I remember, you know, hearing it in church, hearing it, you know, through my parents and family was this context that, you know, we're born a sinner and this context around being bad versus good. And then being in an environment where, um, for example, it was a masculine led, masculine driven environment. And there wasn't a lot of women involved. And did you want to <laughs> say anything? I to say that I, my cat wanted out and I wouldn't normally <laughs> just kind of like go for it. But it's just like you're talking about the old patriarchal order and the minimization of the divine feminine, which doesn't need to triumph over the masculine, but it certainly needs to become in balance. And yes. With it within ourselves and then on the outside, we can stop emasculating our men so that then they can stand proudly and strongly in their own independence on their own beside us and neither have to cast a shadow on the other because both stand in the light of the truth of who and whose they are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So door opened, distraction and turning away and all of that to say out with the old and in with the new, <laughs> like, yeah. So, yes. Ooh, I apologize for interrupting there. That was- Oh, not um, at all. I think the thing that I wanted to actually say that I had forgot was about the fact that you lived a tremendous journey. Like you're telling your story about all of the boxes, but it was like, what about when you actually surrendered the box that we call a house? and sold all of your belongings two years ago and moved to Costa Rica with your husband and got your girls set up as young adults in their own space and then said, mom and dad are going off to do what we didn't do when you were little because we couldn't and now we can and you're on your own, though you're not, the light came on in that moment. So your turn, my friend. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's been, it's been quite the journey and I'm really excited because um, 
I don't know, it's like a whole world has opened up for me. And I just see the possibilities that have opened up in regards to that and what um, what's possible for the new generations in regards to leadership, self-expression and how pivotal it is like right now. So yeah, it's, it, 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 and, it, and again, it's all really related to, um, you know, language, words, our perception, how we see life, how we see people, especially how we see ourselves. Again, it's always about um, inside out. So once we get clear on who we are, and we understand like our true nature, how we function, if we're being self, um, self expressed, it then becomes like a, an influence for everything around us as well. So um, back to like a the context for um how i i guess how i was influenced by the religion is there was this context of not being good enough so that was what i was living under and in in how i took on life was this backgroundness of not good enough so i basically had that and and having that context live behind and live kind of underneath um so as I took on things in my life, and I'll give an example here. So I'm in school and one of my weaker subjects is math. So I struggled with math, especially when it came to problem solving and having that, you know, that context for not being good enough played right into that hugely. So I would take on math and be so discouraged and be like, see, I'm not good enough. And, and I would be so hard on myself. And like, I, I would make stories up and like, just, it would just like, spiral into a, a negative situation to the point where my math teacher um, asked me to move my desk beside hers in front of the class and imagine the horrified <laughs> situation with that in the back of my head and then having you know to sit looking towards everyone and yeah I had this this experience and it was like Oh my God, I couldn't even believe it. And it was like, it, you know, just the worst, you know, situation that could have come about um, trying not to expose this, you know, not good enough. And then here I am sitting in front of the class and everyone sees that I'm struggling with math. So what um, I got now after figuring out, you know, what, what this all was about, you know, that this context was existing and so forth, I really got, oh my God, I made this story up because this was this context I'd created, but in actuality, it, it really speaks to this education system, which is one dimensional. And I was someone who was coming from creativity and I was such a communications girl. Like if I wouldn't stop talking and I'm, but when it came to math, it was like, oh, it was like this little block. But I realize now that it was because the, the education system had a one dimensional learning style, which didn't fit me that, you know, the way they were taking on problem solving wasn't fitting kind of my learning style. So when I look back, I think, oh my God, you can see how if your context is not good enough, how that can be created into a worse situation in that example. But if I take change the context to, well, no, that's just because the school the way that it's set up is only, you know, setting up a learning that's, you know, one style for everyone. And that wasn't my style. So then I realized, oh my God, I had made this big story up. And now I had this freedom that came out of this discovery of the context. So this is the type of thing that we can experience when we look back and we, you know, really discover for ourselves, what are those things that had us or have us, um, react a certain way, take on these, uh, you know, potential dis dysfunctional conversations or why our relationships aren't fully working. And if we really look down deep, it's a context that's driving most of our situations and, and experiences. So if we can really get clear on, let's talk about anything that's, that's dysfunctional and let's, let's really focus on relationships because I think that's important. If there's a relationship with, for example, your husband or your daughter or your parent, or and it's something that keeps reoccurring and it doesn't seem like it goes um, anywhere new, it's probably because 
we're coming into the conversation with the same context. So you're not going to create a new situation if you're continuing to bring into the situation or the relationship the same context. So it's just really evaluating what we're bringing into situations and to our decisions um, that create that backgroundness for what's going to happen. And typically, if we don't, we're not aware of this world that I've just brought forward, we're continuing patterns. It's a pattern that we keep repeating that creates the same future. So if we want to create a new future, we look at the context and see if we can transform the context and that can transform our future. <laughs> relativity context is about relativity everything is relative and so our relationships are so befitting because it's all relatives right and so it's like then it's like the the, the law of relativity is literally in our relatives that have come here to give us the gifts of lessons that other souls wouldn't be willing to take on the karma for but other souls are willing to love us enough to be able to be that asshole in this incarnation that actually offers the lesson of betrayal that completely changes and shatters and transforms your identity. Like the woman that I was telling you about, Linda, in Las Vegas, remember? How yes. Homeless Linda, basically, it ended up that I had this amazing experience with a homeless woman in Las Vegas. For two hours, we connected and bonded, and I, I shared with her the sacred sojourn of the soul. And she had become homeless after her man of 20 years had died three months beforehand, who also happened to be her abuser. And because her identity for 20 years had been vested in being his victim, and the battered partner of a man that she loved, but that tried to kill her regularly. She didn't know who she was when he was no longer in her picture, because sometimes mm -hmm. we allow characters into our space that take up too much of our space. They want mm -hmm. all of our attention. They want to control, confine, conform. They want to make yeah. us fit. They want to make us fill out their forms. They want to give us context and make it their context. His story, whose story, whose agenda, who benefits? Mm -hmm. yeah. Those questions that if we don't ask who's benefiting from this, then why are we not asking such a fundamental question truly? It's so true. It's absolutely, um, like what you just brought up in regards to, again, with, with respect to context and how we look at the people that are in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that was another big one for me. It was like, I took on um, early on and through my childhood into my you know, adulthood, um, almost a victim-like context for you know, why I was having the type of relationships and how things were showing up. And, and again, I looked at it like, wow, like this world's a playground in a way. And it's like, it's been made in a, in a miraculous way to always have us see who we are through other people. So the relationships that we have um, and how we take those on and how they show up is always showing up in regards to who I am. So I'm looking at the relationships, like, for example, with my daughters, because they're very, you know, and um, talk about um, great teachers. My daughters have been my greatest teachers. And through them, I've seen who I am. And so in just changing the context for, you know, not, um, you know, taking things personally, or, you know, just in how I look at relationships in general, it's more now I'm looking at them as um, what am I meant to learn about myself? And um, being present for them, like what I'm doing as well in regards to who I show up for them, who I'm being. So yeah, just um, it, it, for me, it's just, again, all in regards to 
um, the way that I look at situations now, the context that I, I create. And I think um, last week we were talking about um, faith and how faith comes into this as well. And so you would think that coming from a religious background, I was going to be, you know, I would know something about faith, but I realized I wasn't um, connected to faith at all because what I discovered was in living from the knowing, the boxes of just, you know, how you, you um, prepare yourself or you, it, in the knowing you want to be protected. And I don't even know if I'm getting this across correctly, but what I guess I'm trying to say is um, I've learned to be more uh, coming from faith now, um, looking outside of that box that I was coming from. And I realized that faith is actually coming from not knowing. Yeah. It's in the not knowing. <laughs> Intuition, yes, absolutely. It was like one of those mind, mind blowing things. It's like, oh my God, it's not about the knowing. It's about the not knowing. And then again, even the no attachments, like having no attachments, this world of being in the unknown or uncertain. And I, I've been really taking that on now. And I wanted to speak to the fact that, um, so I was just recently through all this um, lockdown and COVID. And so my husband and I got soft evicted from our place, um, or the landlords needed to do, <clears throat> excuse me, some renovations. And anyways, we were very, we, we accommodated them, even though it was something kind of almost last minute, but we took it on like we do with most of our things. And we took it on like a, a, a new challenge. And um, with COVID underway and everything, um, what happened is, is we were very limited with options. So we were put in a bit of a predicament. So what we did was, is we had, you know, we were playing it obviously day to day, but this ended up being a couple of months um, that we were in the search with no home and so what we ended up doing was we took it on as a learning experience and we spent half the time in our car and half the time in hotels and we what we did was um we decided that we would tour ontario because we had never really you know I've, I've been born in toronto born and raised kind of in richmond hill but really led a pretty sheltered life and never got to really experience Ontario. So my husband and I took that on like, okay, we're gonna visit towns across Ontario. And it was one of the most incredible experiences that we had. Um, and I was actually shocked at how I took on the whole car thing. Cause I don't know, people might say that I was high maintenance and whatever. And like, I have these certain things that I need but I actually took it on and the what we were able to discover in that experience I don't think we would have been able to discover um otherwise so what what I can share with you are different things that we experienced so one thing that we got to see was um uh we had different incidences happen so we had someone this this young boy who was um robbing or not robbing he was stealing milk from a shopper's drug mart and long story short um, my husband got into the conversation and discovered that um, his family was um, not doing well and they had not a lot of money and he was literally desperate to get milk for his young brother and uh, the owner of the shopper's drug mart just went off and he literally um, was being very aggressive and Da, da, da. So anyways, to long story short, my husband, and this is where language comes into play, he got into this boy's world and was able to discover the situation. And he had uh, the opportunity as well to talk to the owner of the shoppers. And in, you know, taking on the conversation, was able to have the owner of the shoppers see the situation where he was just, you know, what you, I guess, you fly off the handle, I guess, and think that, you know, you group everybody into the same type of thing where they just steal and so forth. But when um, Peter, my husband, was able to talk to the owner, he actually got him to see this boy's world and see it in a different light. 
And so in that moment, we, he was able to actually um, create for this um, owner in, in a new way of how to look at it. And now the owner is actually helping this boy um, in, in his family. So it goes to show you um, the opportunities we have when we're um, more aware of our environment and then using language to, you know, um, get into people's worlds. It makes such a world of a difference. And I think that's what's lacking today in a way is we don't really spend the time to really look at and find out what people are really dealing with. And if we did, we would find that everyone's pretty much, you know, dealing with the same thing and that there's like a, a unity that we can, I think, that can be created out of that. Yeah. Just add an extra E to the hue of all humanity. And then we're all hues included and there's no separation. And we start realizing that the old question that safe, secret societies would ask when they were still considered sacred instead of secret was, how do you know when you are suffering? And that was how you actually bought admission into the sacred society, because it is to know that someone else is suffering and to see yourself suffering in their suffering and to decide to help you both by helping them. And it's exactly. just like we have stopped having that question asked because the sacred has been monetized and turned secret. So there is a fight between the sacred and the secret. And this is why religion has become so inseparable from God. And it's just like, okay, wait a minute. So you're telling me that God is all, all things. God is it, right? But then you're telling me that other people have taken that same idea of the all and put a different label on it, a different status, a different title on the same energy and because it's a different title status or label that's been assigned to the same thing it is considered to be different sounds like legalese to me yeah what is legalese yeah what is legalese well legalese is the language that is spoken by the law society or the bar which is very much connected and intertwined with the crown, which is the Vatican. And the Vatican is part of the de facto government, which is how we have de facto rule in place right now, where if we actually claim the rights to stand as men and women in our sovereignty, which sovereignty is questionable in terms of whether that is a status that we would like to actually claim access to, because if you break down the word as I do, I see Sue Verain, which is Sue is under, Ver is right, and Rain is rule. So under right rule, Sue Verain, well, whose rule is the question? And if you're mm -hmm. not under the rule of anyone else, then how are you self-governing and where is your army? Because there are requirements in order to declare yourself sovereign too, that people don't necessarily have the ability to fulfill. And if you don't have the ability to fulfill the title requirements that you are applying for through the status that you are trying to take on, then you don't actually have the rights that you thought you did when you claimed something that wasn't actually what you inherently were. Because I don't know about you, but I wasn't born sovereign. Like I wasn't born with anyone being able to like say, hey, she's sovereign. Well, I was in fact, because we all were born living. And then our foot was stamped because of the W in law, which is the Admiralty Maritime Contract Law that would have us first step foot on the lands of the water, which is Admiralty Maritime Contract Law. And so then by stepping first, the baby's first footprint onto the record of another form then the one that stepped first onto that land instead of any other then was able to actually be assumed consumed by the application of a status within a corporeal body or the body corporate right the hole and then the cog in the hole or the wheel 
that we're so familiar with hearing? Well, this is individualism compared to like the whole gestalt. So for instance, with everything you're talking about, it's like, it takes me back to the Santa Claus gestalt, which I read a chapter from Joyriding the Universe about. And there were times I wanted to also mention about the Right Use of Will series by C. Anne de Rohan with what you were saying previously about the will body manifestation awareness, which is God principle and will is mother principle and then heart in the middle that acts as the bridge, which is how we really ground in that material. And so I'm so grateful that we're having this conversation because you're sharing your story. I'm sharing some of mine and my theories and you're sharing your theories. And together people are able to choose from a buffet of options, of ideas that will either benefit you, hinder you, or could be modified in order to benefit you. And you have to be the one that discerns all of that. But how does spiritual discernment fit into all of this, Katia? Woo. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, for me, I think it, it was, um, my experience was really getting down to what was the message I was receiving in, um, what was being shared like between you know my visits to church um the community my parents and for me what i discerned was there was a context of diminishment it was like a context of diminishment and i'm not surprised and it's um part of why we take on in a way as well this scarcity mentality because if we're not you know, coming from an empowered state, we look at the world in a disempowered state or in a state of scarcity. And it's far from the truth. Like I, I really discovered taking on, um, you know, growing microgreens and, and really understanding about seeds. What I found out about seeds is that one seed can produce hundreds, if not thousands of seeds. So right there is a demonstration of abundance that's all around us. And it's like, I've had this skewed look for so many years about, you know, scarcity and having that run my life and um, the worry and the concern and the fear and really, um, you know, having this epiphany in regards to um, just even the seed as an example, that we were born into a garden of Eden that has everything that we would ever need. We have an abundance of trees, an abundance of water, an abundance of animals and vegetation and everything that we would ever need. And um, here we are, you know, this, you know, we're looking out into the world now and, and, you know, we've, we see how scarcity has played out where now we're, you know, running out of trees and we're running, you know, we've got water that's polluted. And so it's time right now. It's such a pivotal time. And I'm excited because if we change the context, even in that, how we look at, um, you know, ourselves again, first, that we have this miraculous body that functions like a science lab. <laughs> so we've got everything that we need on the inside. If we treat our bodies well, our bodies are, you know, working in abundance. It's, it's working for our balance. It's working for our, you know, for our best well being. And so it is outside. So is the earth. And so it's just a matter of, you know, when we treat ourselves well, we automatically will treat everything outside of us well. So again, the, 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 I guess the discernment for me is really about what's the message that religion is, um, is, is communicating fundamentally. And for me, it was all about that. I just really identified with the, um, the diminishment context in regards to um, this bad and good and this diminishment in regards to women in a way. So I, I really got clear on that. And um, 
yeah, I just think it's time that we look at um, all the areas of our life, look at the context for which they, um, how we allow that to dictate those areas of our life and taking each area step by step allows us to experience, I think, limitless possibility and um, be able to take our world now into a new era um, where we're able to create a new future, a new paradise on earth. And it's all with language and context. And I was going to say, because, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say about the Garden in Eden or the, the Garden in Eden. If we actually look at it, guard, the guard is us in Eden, which is the energy den, the energetic den of us our bodies and then earth also is the ear with a th to give it some extra power right and then if you actually break down the heart um i was actually having a conversation with a friend today and it was just like especially on valentine's day but it's like two ears make the shape of a heart if you put them <laughs> together and isn't that so beautiful if you actually if we learn to listen with our ears and pay mind and heart and it's just like when you were saying earlier about like getting caught in your head it's just like when you're in your head there was that um I forget I think it was Sydney back in university when we studied Sydney's work and he talked about noxus and praxis which is knowledge and practice it's just like you've lived it so it's like it's went from theory to heart-based lived experience that birthed you in order for you to have a different level of wisdom and insight to contribute compared to when you just have studied it and you know it all I was like don't yeah. get to know it all because you can't fill an um, you can't fill an already full cup it's just like you can you know you can you can add some flavor to it but ultimately like if that cup is already full it's not interested in taking on a new flavor likely it's just going to be like get away from me I'm already good you know, what can you add to me? And then it will minimize you in order to keep its power because we are experiencing systematic bullying right now. And all of these boxes are what have kept us playing small because, oh my God, this week it became so clear to me. I'm so excited. So the higher <laughs> of creation, right? We are so focused on our differences with all of the religions of the world that put us into different legions of belief systems that make us say i'm be better or different or you know i'm not going to say i'm less than but i'm better you know and it's just like wtf can we get over ourselves please like we're all better or worse at things than others but that's why we live in common unity with one another instead of these religions that make us think that because we're putting God in a different box that it's any different. Well, if we take God out of the box and just say, okay, like, isn't all of it energy? And they say that there's more space in between the cells that are vibrating that make us seem to be what we are in this 3D reality that we create, which is realistic evidence appearing legit in tomorrow's yesterday, might I add? <laughs> or is it like if we can just take God out of that box and we put it about energy on the top of that pyramid, that is more inclusive and energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only displaced, right? So now instead of saying God or Allah or creator or source, we just say energy's on the top and energy made us men and women, which mm. there's a transhumanism agenda. There is a whole legalese initiative to make us think we're talking about one thing but actually in becoming another or a trans anything it makes it transactional because you have to then exchange with a third party which has been what the churches have been in order to they be the middleman for them to for then us to be able to connect with what they say they have to connect with for us because that keeps them in a power position where we have to tithe to them because we need to get their blessing because we can't get it on our own anymore because now we've put church or institution in between us and our creator source 
Well, no, that's what happens when in the hierarchy of creation, you've got energy on top, man or woman underneath of that. And then you've got the government underneath of that, which is where the legislation comes in. So that if you did want to take on a trans label, for instance, you then drop from being a man or woman into being a status of a trans anything or of a person, which is a trust as one of the definitions. It's also a definition for a corporation or an artificial person. It's many definitions underneath of the definition of person. So understand that when you become a person, when you start to see yourself as a person, instead of a man or a woman, you actually drop your standing because men and women stand. Statuses position themselves to make it look like they are, but they're just like the wizard of Oz with Dorothy, right? Yeah. So you got government. This is what was so exciting about the boxes though. Because you know how underneath the government is the cops, courts, councils? which is what uphold the legislation of the governments. And then underneath of that was the corporations. Yes. Well, I just like, understand how it fit together from a box perspective, but now I do. Because basically if we look at it from a de facto government perspective, which is what we have instead of the de jure government that is of the people, for the people, by the people. This is how we actually stand and walk on common ground together using common law to enforce our common law, which is our unwritten and unlimited rights as men and women with all rights reserved at all times that know how to claim our rights and then stand on our claims and then enforce our claims for any man or woman that is trespassing against the claims that we've made about what we believe that we have a right to do, which is what all of right. the truckers, for instance, need to do. Any trucker that is involved in this, if you're going by the designation or a status of a trucker or a driver, and you've registered your vehicles instead of just having it recorded, which means that it's recorded if anything were to happen to it, but the property is still actually yours compared to when you register it. They can be taken away at any time because you've signed over authority, which is the author I tie my identity or that thing to when traded. And brought in another middleman for it. Okay, well, here's mm -hmm. the interesting thing. In the government, we got the de facto government, which is where the Vatican come in and which is where this whole corporatocratic attempted takeover is in, where the transhumanism agenda comes in as well, where we'd get men and women to drop our standing into an other that was created as a term. The term was created by the government, but then because the government created the term and because the man or woman dropped their standing to accept the status of something other than what they originally were, aboriginal, no longer an original because dropped standing into a status to carry a status card to show identity. Well, mm -hmm. when we actually step into the de facto governmental system, what we have is a series of boxes on top of boxes on top of boxes, which is why our space gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller. Because we've got the federal government at the top, which is a corporation the corporation of Canada. You have, another go you have another corporation on top of that, which is the corporation of Ontario, which is where we live. But you've got other corporations, which are the municipalities that each of us individually live within, within the provincial corporation, within the federal corporation of Canada, correct? And then within even that, then we have the corporations, which is the public sector of the right or the private sector of the public domain, which are the corporations that had to create policies for the vaccination schedule, correct? An mm -hmm. HR woman told me the only requirement was to create the policy. There were no requirements for what was included within that policy other than to say that it had to be created and held on record in the company because that is the mandate that's the rule that they have to abide by because a corporation needs to show that they are adhering to company bylaws and procedures and policies and rules right. because that shows that they're acting in good faith but I forgot what I was going to say. Do you have anything to add at this point? Well, I was going to say, like, I know that um, I'm not sure if you wanted to share with with us tonight, but 
I was going to say, what was your experience? You went, I understand that you were um, in court or you had a, a, a proceeding on Friday. And I was going to say, maybe share your experience in um, what your experience was of the language box of language that you went in, that you were experienced in, in that there. Experience. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that perspective. I wouldn't. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, basically, when I went into court, it was a Zoom room, not the official one. Um, but basically, when I showed up for the hearing for my matter to be heard, which I've tried to address via lawful notices, which have been sent via registered post, I have sent 15, including a claim against the man acting as prosecutor for bringing a false claim in front of a public court against me, the woman. Because I have clarified that I am the woman commonly known as Laura Hamilton, not, a, not to be confused with uh, the corporation or the trust of a similar name. And also specified that I do not consent to being a surety for the person which it is, we are implied to be our person until we clarify otherwise. So basically in the court, when they do the roll call to call you for your role to perform because you don't get to be you, that's why you have to take the stand and start instead of have a standing, right? That was kind of like a click last week of like, oh yeah, you know what I have? We don't, nobody has any standing in a public court because it's all a charade. Like you got a judge wearing a fucking wig, pardon my language, but the whole charade is pretty ridiculous that you're supposed to call your worship. Well, I don't worship any of you, your warships, thanks. Like pirates- Talk about language. Pardon? Talk about language. Yeah, no pun intended. I was just about to say- <laughs> I'm just about to swear again, almost got three in a, three in a minute. Um, yeah, but seriously, like worship and your worship, like your worship is approaching. Which flag would be most appropriate for me to be able to overtake the vessel commonly known as Katia Palmieri? Or what flag would most easily be able to deceive the woman commonly known as Laura J.E. Hamilton in order to have her drop her standing, which is her guard, within the energy den of me in order to invite evil in because it has to be invited in. Mm -hmm. And so in the court, when I was called for my role, I said, I am here for that matter. And they said, okay, what is your name? And I said, I am the woman commonly known as Laura Hamilton in my private capacity with all common law rights reserved at all times here for that matter. Because what I did not do was drop my standing, which meant I did not take a knee to any other corporation or their jurisdiction, which juris is of right or of law and diction is what a spoke or wrote. So I didn't mm. agree to anyone else's rules because I didn't accept any joinders of my name to any status or implied status because I clarified that I was not to be implied to be anything other than what I am, which is a woman. If and I then what, so what happened when you did that? Like what, what, how is that different than what most people go in and, and do? Like, well, how did it? Well, most people get a lawyer to represent them, which means the lawyer can only ever represent the man or woman as the legal fiction. So when I showed up at court, I was the only woman present at court that day because mm -hmm. I was standing as I truly am. True lie, I am a woman. So I stand of my own two feet and I also reserve the right to maintain my standing on matters that I believe in with conviction. And that is my standing. And everyone else that is there under as a ward of the out of the court for instance so anyone that gets represented by a lawyer is a ward of the court which means that they are the equivalent of a child with an abusive parent the parent is essentially her majesty who is the one that's pressing the charge who has hired the prosecutor and the judge 
and also is biased in choosing a jury. So the, cor the, the corporatocratic takeover is basically a rigged system that anybody that has access to the secrets had to ultimately swear an oath of allegiance first and foremost to the bar or the crown in order to agree to protect the system at the expense of the individual. So any individual such as myself that is standing as a woman fully present and not needing any representation, which they're looking to do because if they can get me to show that I am not competent to be able to make decisions for myself, then they can evoke the Mental Health Act and then have my sanity questioned, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what the terrorists, I mean, the truckers need to be aware of with this convoy. I'm not implying that anyone is a terrorist that is involved with this initiative. However, I am recommending you be aware so you can be aware of the application of the status of a terrorist to your person. Because mm -hmm. that is another status, which is another box within a box within a box within a box. So going back mm -hmm. to what I was saying about the HR woman that told me about the requirement for a mandatory vaccination uh, policy. The only right. requirement was the creation of the policy. Everything else within that was a recommendation. The problem was, is that the system also convinced everyone that only legal professionals can handle those kind of matters because everyone else is too stupid, right? Because not good enough. We've been trained mm -hmm. to not think that we could because someone else can do it better, clearly. And so then all of the men and women acting in the corporate positions hired out the policy creation to a consultant that oftentimes was paid by the government to create something that conformed with governmental protocol, but that actually turned the requirement or the recommendations into requirements within the corporate policies. So then recommendations were made to become requirements at the corporate level which was then imposed by the municipal or provincial or federal governmental level. So you have four boxes over top of the individual who has dropped their standing from being a man or woman on top of all of this in the private to then being part of the public charade. So then you become the person that is in the box at the bottom of the pyramid in the center of it that's compressed by all of these boxes of the federal, provincial, municipal, and then corporate policies, which is why anyone that has actually maintained their position throughout all of this have done so on tentative grounds. Because the thing that people need to also remember, and it is nine o'clock, so I don't know how you're fixed for tonight or whether you want to uh, wrap up or whether you want to go a little longer. Um, I think that this conversation is vital. And also, mm -hmm. I respect the fact that we've been at it for an hour. So I have 10 minutes. You got 10 minutes. We better make them good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to do something, but the time distracted me and so I lost my train of thought if there was something that you wanted to uh, say from what I've just shared well so this is all this is a new world of language for me what you bring forward and it's why I'm so captivated by it because like I said I'm very um, clear on how important language is especially now so what I'm interested in is um because you have the uh the background on the legalese like the the law and how it's worded and who we are when we when we're presented in front of a judge and what i'm interested in is um so you're taking on in a way a new paradigm a new way of presenting yourself or ourselves in court and i was more curious about how was that taken by the judge like what was the because this is I, i'm not certain that everyone's doing this there's probably a few people now starting to take this approach yeah so so i'm interested to see yeah so um, yeah i was just i was interested to hear that go ahead <laughs> time that the judge has actually shown up out of the four hearings previously every other time it's been adjourned before it's been heard because they couldn't afford to send a judge 
This time the judge said she had no idea what this matter was in regards to because she had no information on it, which was her way to hmm. uh, wipe her hands of it and give me a, pre a pre-trial hearing. That's all she was willing to do. And I did though manage to say that I did not accept the application of any statuses or titles because I was called Miss Laura Hamilton, which Miss is a title. So when you accept a title, then you are considered a joinder, which is where you become a fiction because now you've had a title applied to you, which is a status, which drops your standing into their jurisdiction. So now you play by their rules because mm -hmm. they applied a, a title to you that you didn't uh, reject and uh, correct. Therefore, it is your error that they made an error that you didn't catch and therefore you pay. Wow. Yeah. So um, it's very tricky because this whole system is designed to save itself significant energy, money, time. And basically we're interfering with that because now we're showing up saying, no, I'm present. I don't need any representation, which is exactly actually what I did say. And so I spoke my truth fully and I also asked for my matter to, or the claim that I've made against the man acting as prosecutor who is bringing a false claim in front of a public court against me to be heard at the same time because uh, we are actually um, we are all eligible for competent jurisdiction, which is only common law, because that is the only language that we speak commonly. We do not speak legalese unless we have been to the association or the institution, and we have not. Therefore, it is not our competent jurisdiction, which means we do not fall under the juris of law or of right and diction of what a spoker wrote of the legal society. And the court of law is land, air, and water, which are three jurisdictions where there's a judge in each of the jurisdictions, which is why the common law argument doesn't work. But this is mm. actually a mixed war between the public and the private. And when we catch on to that fact, then that's when we realize that when we're standing on common ground using common law to enforce that which we are making claims about and in reference to lawfully exercising our rights through practice, that's when we turn this game around. That's when we can start holding men and women liable in their private capacity because we say, you take your suits off if you wanna play with me. And if you wanna speak in my court, which we have the ability to run a concurrent court with common law and whatever other law is being worked through, the common law argument is just the common or the, the common law, and then you've got the uh, canons and the contracts also being judged in that same matter. But if you remain in your private capacity, you actually stay out of the public court where all statuses are applied. So if you can actually learn how to stand in the present moment, which is the syntax we have to get back to, which syntax uh, was a definition that we can go into another time around uh, the joining together of meanings to the words and the letters that are used to make them. And all of these things are so fundamental, but essentially the biggest thing to remember and the visual that kind of came together here tonight for me is that within the hierarchy of creation, energy's on top, man or woman's under energy because we were made in its image and likeness. And then we created the government in ours to make our lives easier. And then the cops courts councils are the municipal governments that essentially uphold the legislation for the provincial and federal governments because while we're all confused, all of our provinces are actually sovereign which means they're independent already. So all of the separatist movements, you've already got what you want. Stop fighting for it. What do you want now? Like, what do you want now that you got what you want? Woo! Right? <laughs> of course, however that goes. So anyway, corporations at the bottom. But if you look at the government as being the, the, the federal government, the provincial government, the municipal government, the corporate government, and then the person at the bottom of that inside of the little cell, that's what a person is. That is what a status is. 
when you agree to go by your legal name, which is your last name, not your God-given names, which came above government and before government, therefore is not owned by government, though is joinered to the last name, which is the legal Roman last name, when we actually recognize all of that, that is when we see that we are not our person. We are the man or woman that would have to drop a knee, which literally throughout the centuries, that's been what it's been about, right? Mm-hmm. Well, now Absolutely. we're on a status instead of stand. So I made it's my standing and I have a pre-hearing trial or a pre-trial hearing May 4th now. So I was so thrilled because before I signed off, I couldn't believe it, but I just had to because I couldn't resist, though I could have if I wanted to, but I didn't. So I did anyway. And basically my final words that I got to speak on the court for public record is may the fourth be with you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it was just like that. How perfect is that? <laughs> Yeah, so for the rest of, uh, for the months leading up to May 4th, I will say, may the 4th be with you. <laughs> so amazing. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the update. And uh, the man acting as prosecutor, uh, he may reach out to me because apparently they've been communicating with everyone because they're supposed to offer disclosure, but I haven't used their forms because that's another way that they create or they gain jurisdiction over you. Because if you consent to use their forms on paper, then right. you're committing to the forms that they are putting you into as the fiction that you are agreeing to play using their form. Mm -hmm. So to request disclosure using their form as an independent or as a woman in my private capacity means that I am actually creating a joinder with the form that I am asking for, which then is putting me into a supplicatory uh, position, which is then where I am dependent, which is a status on the provider and so that's where then all of these uh, confusions are made so clarity really is an important c in peaceful inner warriors united which is my initiative uh, but ultimately it does really strongly connect to context which katya talked about tonight so i love this conversation about words and the power of language and the boxes of language that uh, we have used to keep ourselves separate from one another it is 909 it has been a glorious hour and nine minutes so thank you thank you thank you uh, it's an absolute pleasure always and to everyone who is watching the replay of this please do smash that like button as everyone says i need to get better at doing the self-promotory stuff but ultimately if you don't smash the like i'm already shadow banned on most things so people are not getting to see it unless you help us get this message out and i hope you will find it worthy of doing so without a doubt so on that note we will say peace out yo Woo! thank you, you. thank you